is Michelle Hearn, you guys. Run, eat, meet, repeat. I, I loved it. First time I ever saw your username on Instagram, I was like, run, eat, meet, repeat. There's nothing else to say. Like you just said what you're all about. That's good branding, by the way. Thank you. So Thank you very much. So you've been out there a little bit now. Um, how long have you been online, I guess, doing your work? She is a registered dietitian, by the way, you guys. Yeah, you know, so, I mean, I've been a registered dietitian for quite a while. I, I became a dietitian in 2009, but I've transitioned to, you know, a meat-based diet, and I'm sure we'll dive into that back in uh, November of 2019. And, you know, I really decided to kind of put myself out there about a month later, just because I got really angry at uh, how much better I felt and how it changed my life and my health. So, you know, the goal initially was like, you know what, I'll get on, I'll get on there. I'll share my story. Maybe I'll get a couple hundred people that are kind of interested and we'll just kind of see how this goes. Woo, she talks fast, you guys. See, I'm a slow talker. And, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm like, I'll okay. try to slow down. I'll try to slow down. I get excited. No, oh, it's wonderful. Where, where is that from? Where, where, where do you live? I'm a, I live right now in Vancouver, Washington. So right outside of Portland, Oregon. Um, I work in, in Portland. I'm originally from Texas. So. You from Texas? She's supposed to talk a little more like me, Michelle. <laughs> I might say y'all, yeah, watch out. You know. All will work, except yeah. if you say as fast as you've been talking, we won't be able to understand it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome. I'm definitely intrigued as a registered dietitian. What got you interested in wanting to be that back in the knots uh, when you got your RD uh, licenseship? Um, talk about that journey. What got you interested in kind of helping people with their diet? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so if we back way up, um, you know, my history, I actually had a pretty serious eating disorder when I was much younger. I, when I was 12, um, I was almost five feet tall. I was 4'11", and I weighed 57 pounds. So I was uh, hospitalized for 90 days. And I remember, you know, I standing outside of the doctor's office, uh, hearing him tell my parents that there was a really good chance that I wasn't going to survive. And that was, you know, as a 12-year-old, as a that, was, that was terrifying. And as I went through treatment, that was my first um, interaction with the dietitian. And I told her, like, straight up, like, I, I was really, I didn't understand. Even at that time, I didn't really understand the nutrition guidelines. I didn't understand why, why is peanut butter considered a protein when it doesn't have all this protein? And why, are, you know, why is a donut considered, you know, the same as, like, a, 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 a potato as far as carbohydrates? And uh, so I basically told her, you know, at the age of 12, you know, with all my wisdom, uh, I said, you know, someday I'm going to be a dietitian and I'm going to be way better than you. <laughs> what a pain in the, you know, what a little brat. But um, to her credit, she said, yeah, do it. You're just, you're going to have to recover. And, you know, as I, as I went through recovery and as I, you know, was able to gain weight and I got quite a bit better, I, um, you know, I found distance running and I found how, how nutrition had this really powerful impact on, on my health. And I thought, like, if I can go from being so sick to being much better, can I potentially help people do that? Like, that was my initial goal. And then, you know, unfortunately, you become a dietitian and you just find out how horrible the nutrition guidelines are and how much suffering they've caused. And did you know in the midst of it, like in the midst of like the decade that you were a dietitian before you found carnivore? Did, were you cognizant of that disconnect between what we're teaching our clients, what we're supposed to teach our clients, and what actually worked? Yes. Uh, you know, when I became a dietitian in 2009, at that time, um, my governing board, they're called the Academy of Nutrition. Back then, they were called the uh, American Dietetics Association. And they encourage you to be a member. You don't have to be. I refused to be a member. At that time, they were their number one sponsors were Coca-Cola, Hershey's, and PepsiCo. Really? That's not much better now. That Coca-Cola doesn't sponsor them anymore, but Pepsi still does. So does General Mills and, and several other things we can talk about. But I, I realized at that time that um, protein and fat had a much bigger role than they wanted it to have. At that time, I still was under the impression that you really needed carbohydrates. Like I, I valued blood sugar stability, but I thought it really all came down to fiber. Like, okay, if I can teach my patients, you know, they can have bread, they can have potatoes, but they got to hammer those vegetables, you know? And I was also still under the impression that time that meat, um, meat was an important part of the diet. I mean, I've ate meat most of my life, but I, I thought it needed to be a very small part. Like I was really big on, you know, the, uh, 
I, I used to preach that you couldn't eat enough vegetables. And so that, that was kind of how I went into it. And, you know, I had some success with, um, I would do one-on-one -on -one consults with, with, with athletes and with runners, but I saw that the general population, you know, the diabetics and people with heart disease, people, um, you know, sarcopenia, like they just weren't getting better. They just, people were struggling and people were suffering. And so I started to question, like, do you, does it make sense? You know, does it make sense that my diabetic patient whose blood sugar is super high, that I give them this carbohydrate diet and then I tell them to dose with insulin? You know, I, I say in, um, in my book, like, it's kind of the, it's kind of like saying, okay, your house is on fire. We're going to throw gasoline on it. And then we're going to like, you know, dose it with insulin, like a fire extinguisher. Like, why don't we just not set our house on fire? <laughs> <laughs> makes too much sense doesn't it so yeah and it's, so oh sorry go ahead i was gonna say it's amazing i've heard over the years dietitians say treat meat like a condiment on your plate so it's just kind of an afterthought just a little bit of something something uh, you know and and you said there was a de-emphasis in your training and in what they were teaching telling you how to uh, teach uh, clients yes to focus anything at all on the car on the uh, fat and the protein, but just the carbohydrate, which is so ludicrous when you think about we have essential amino acids, essential yeah. fatty acids, essential meaning your body can't make them. You have to eat them to get them. There is no such thing as an essential carbohydrate acid. It doesn't exist. <laughs> and you know what? Honestly, I don't. I'm not even sure if most dietitians know that. Like, I, you know, when I go and talk to people in the hospital, you know, I'll ask like, how many carbohydrates do you think you need? And most people will give you some type of number. And I'm like, it's zero. Like your body needs zero. I mean, we are taught, it's like indoctrinated over and over again that you need these whole grains and all of our sponsors, you know, when you're sponsored by General Mills, when you're sponsored by Kellogg's, you know, they pay a lot of money to, you know, to, to have these pamphlets that are given to you, to have their, the teaching, to be at your conferences, to give you all these free samples. Um, yeah, so I was always taught too that, you know, a, a protein, specifically those like high saturated fat proteins, we're talking like, you know, beef and lamb and those things, like those are going to cause your cholesterol, your LDL specifically to raise, and that's bad. Like we, they really categorize cholesterol as LDL bad, you know, HDL good, where, you know, if you take a step back, you know, I always tell people like, when we're looking at these things, we want to understand nutrition, we have to do two things. One, we have to get back to what were humans designed to eat? Like, as you know, nutrition science, a lot of it's garbage. A lot of it's sponsored by Coke or sponsored by other things. Like, you can't trust a study that's funded by Coca-Cola. Hopefully this isn't newsflash to, like, a lot of your listeners. But human physiology doesn't change. Like, what we were designed to eat, you know, we are designed to eat meat and fat. And some people can tolerate small amounts of carbohydrates. And as we've moved away from that, you know, we're seeing chronic diseases, like, go off the charts. Yeah, and, and Coca-Cola has its evil hands in a lot of different industries, not just the dietetics industry. We know that they created a front group for the medical professionals that end up as the experts on the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee. Over half of them for the 2020 committee were from this Coke-sponsored organization, fake medical organization. Uh, I just did a Jimmy Rance recently about Coke kind of being found out to fund all these studies and they had total autonomy over everything about the study, including squashing it if it didn't have the results that made them look good.
it would come every week, you know? And even more than that, that's a great idea. And I've said as much on my shows over the years uh, to have that kind of multifaceted kind of approach, more like a functional medicine of different mm -hmm. specialties. But even more than that, teaching that all of these issues you're dealing with are the issue of insulin resistance and that the insulin resistance is being profoundly impacted by the foods that you're putting in your body. And so that kind of education piece is not coming in there. The reason why people keep eating their carbohydrates is they've gotten a free pass. Oh, it's Cheerios. It's got healthy whole grains in there. So therefore, I'm a good person when I eat it in my skim milk in the morning. So subliminally in their heads, they think that's a good behavior. And so why, how could it be bad now? They've been telling me it's good all these years, even though health is deteriorating, obesity is present, and you're about to die because you did the very things they told you that was supposed to make you live longer. Yeah, nutrition beliefs are very entrenched, and you made a really good point because, you know, when I go see patients, even somebody who's severely diabetic, let's say your A1C is like 14, you're, you know, you're 400 pounds, they will tell you, people think, you know, a lot of times people will tell you what they think you want to hear. They'll say, oh, I, I really eat really well. I have a banana with my, you know, Cheerios and skim milk, and then I just have a sandwich and some low-fat chips, like, They'll tell you these things. And a lot of times, you know, Brian and I were talking about this, Brian Sanders, a lot of people are genuinely trying to follow the guidelines. You know, as a dietitian, I've been told, and this is a belief among many med medical professionals, certainly not all, and I know a lot of medical professionals are fantastic and are coming around, but the, the reason patients are obese, the reason patients are um, sick is because they're just not following the nutrition guidelines. If we just followed it, if we just ate more fruits and vegetables, and that's not what the statistics say. Since 1970, we're eating 21% more whole grains, we're eating more fruits and vegetables, we're eating less beef, we're eating a lot less animal fat, yeah. and we're thicker. And you made a great point. It really all comes back to insulin resistance. I mean, people, a lot of people associate insulin resistance with like, oh, it's, it just has to do with diabetes. I mean, high insulin affects so many other organ systems. You know, it affects your all your steroid hormones. I mean, people with uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, people... Um, you know, even we're even seeing insulin resistance in the brain can cause issues with depression and cause it with anxiety and certainly later on can cause, you know, Alzheimer's and, and, you know, other cognitive issues. Yeah, I had Ben Bickman on recently, uh, who is all about insulin resistance. He'd be a great person for your show uh, cool. to about that. But uh, speaking of your show, talk about your podcast video. Show. <laughs> it's pretty cool. I appreciate that. Yeah. So, you know, I, um, my, my wife had told me, she's like, you got it. Cause I would just have kind of similar to you. I just, we'd be talking in the morning and I'd have certain rants about certain things. And, and she's like, you should start interviewing people. You should start talking to people. And I was like, Oh, geez. Yeah. I, I don't know. And, you know, I decided, all right, let's just do it. And so I call it, you know, it's the dietitian's dilemma is the name of my YouTube. And it really is. The dilemma is I have this information. I want to get it out. And I'm really not able to, to do that in my current, you know, in my current role at the hospital. So how can I disseminate that? And how can I, um, you know, once again, how can I encourage people that are struggling who just think like, oh, I'm just a failure. I'm always going to be overweight. It's, it's my genetics. And so, you know, the goal was to reach out to people in the ketogenic and carnivore community um, of uh, all different backgrounds. You know, I've had, I've been so fortunate to have you know, RNs and pharmacists and, um, you know, just kind of everyday people and athletes just share their experience. And what I have found is that so many of us are so similar, you know, I've had eating struggles, I've had all these things that it just, it, they seem like, oh man, I'm the only one that's dealing with this and I'm a failure, but it's quite ubiquitous. You know, my goal was to really connect people and just to teach, to teach like, hey, this is what this person is doing. This is working. And yeah, just to kind of offer some inspiration. And it's been, it's been really positive. It's kind of slowly growing. But uh, yeah, it's been it's been a really fun thing to do. Well, and as somebody who's done this craft for 15 years, you're very good for being so new to it. So goes yeah. for kind of up with the concept, put it out there. It's not as easy being behind the the camera and behind the microphone asking questions of people. So you do it so fluidly. I I want to be you when I grow up. So oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> so the book. What's the book about? Oh, I'm so excited about the book. So. You know, I started writing the book last December and initially, you know, that's a great, that's a great question. I, I don't have a title yet. I, you know, I'm thinking about the maybe if it's some, something title. around the dietitian's dilemma or I don't know. <laughs> the dietitian's dilemma would be a fabulous title. Just take it from somebody. I've written nine books. 
the oh my god dilemma <laughs> rings a bell it's it's just got all the little you kind of go ooh intrigued tell me more yeah. well and it, you know it goes through kind of my, my personal story and i'm i'm it's the first draft is out so it's it's being edited right now um and i'll probably edit down my my story but kind of like my journey through you know going through like anorexia and severe depression and anxiety and just the different things I tried and how, you know, in my recovery, I was told like, Hey, you're always going to struggle. You're always going to have anxiety. And I kind of came to a point in my life was I was like, okay, this is my, this is my reality. I have to be able to function, you know, dealing with anxiety. And I'm, when I eat, I'm going to be staring at the clock, you know, and be, Oh, is it time to eat again? You know, I was constantly riding this blood sugar roller coaster, but I just thought that was normal. And then, um, you know, how my, my running basically fell off a cliff. I decided I was going to quit running after, you know, doing it for almost two decades. And then I came across this crazy diet called, I was, I was interested in a ketogenic diet initially. And then I saw this crazy diet called the carnivore diet and this crazy guy named Sean Baker. And I, and I just couldn't, I couldn't wrap my head around it, but I was intrigued. And at that time, I, I was having really severe muscle pain. Like, I couldn't sleep through the night. Um, I was having muscle spasms. I was getting, like, cold sweats. Like, I think my body was just, like, so tired of the massive amounts of carbohydrates I'd been giving it. So I decided, you know, I'm going to take in – I'm going to just eat – I'm just going to try this crazy carnivore diet. And it, the goal was to be very short-term. My partner initially did not like this. <laughs> she was like, this is eating disorder. I don't like this. Um, but after about two weeks, like I felt so much better, like my energy was better. I, I could go hours without eating. My muscle pain started to get better and years of anxiety, like all of a sudden just, I can't even describe it, you know, and, and anybody who's been there has experienced it. And finally, by about, uh, about week three, my wife sat me down and was like, look, I don't know if I like this yet, but your anxiety is the best it's been in the 11 years I've known you. Like, wow. and, and so now she's, I mean, long story, she's a carnivore <laughs> with me but yeah and so the book it starts with my story and then I went through five conditions that I felt like I could speak really well to with my 11 years experience you know we, we go through diabetes uh, mental illnesses I worked in two different psychiatric facilities uh, eating disorders um, sarcopenia which is muscle wasting in the elderly and heart disease and I've seen all of those so I'm using my experience what I've seen I also have over 200 clinical trials in there, um, mostly like, you know, low carbohydrates, what they say. Um, I pull some work from, you know, people who've gone before me, you know, I'll reference some of Paul Saladino's work, some of Diana Rogers' work. Um, I have, interestingly, people have been messaging me. They want to see uh, what I what I do to run, like what I eat. So I do have a chapter, you know, see how she runs, that I have have my current nutrition plan. It's, I'm, I'm pretty boring when I get a lot of ground beef, you know. Um, and then I've just, what I'm most excited about is the people that I've networked with. You know, I have over 20 testimonies from people I admire so much, you know, um, Amber Wentworth, the Lone Star Keto Girl, uh, you know, Nevada Gray, uh, the carb addiction doctor, people who struggle with eating disorders, uh, uh, two regenerative farms. Uh, you know, I've had the inter opportunity to interview White Oak Pastures and a farm close to me here. Uh, it's called Kukulin Farms. And, you know, my goal is that people can read this, like anybody, even if you don't know much about science, you can read it. It makes sense to you. Uh, I'm talking with health coach Kate right now about using some of her graphics um, and that it can at least get the wheels started because, you know, I was at a place in my life uh, and I, unfortunately I've been a couple of times where you're just hopeless, you know, at one point severely suicidal, just like I, I can't, I can't get better. I can't get out of this. And food has such a powerful impact on our brain. I don't think we teach that enough in the medical profession. When you are able to provide your, you know, the, the, the saturated fat and the protein, it can completely reverse how you think. And so I want everybody, I want everybody to realize there's an alternative solution. Because when I was suffering, like in my lowest point, I reached out to two different dietitians and two different doctors. And they both told me, just keep doing what you're doing, keep eating fruits and vegetables. And I mean, I literally felt hopeless and I'm so grateful for, for Sean and for, you know, Ken Berry and for you and for people that are just, we're just not, we're just not going to take the bullshit. You know, we're, we're going to keep talking. We're going to keep preaching. We're going to keep doing what works because we want to help people. Yeah. A amen. I mean, that's like the heart song of everything that keeps me going 15 years later strong. Uh, and I love what you said about your book, which tentatively, when is it coming out? Uh, 
So the girl who's helping me edit told me I need to be a little bit more realistic with my expectation. I was hoping for November. We're probably looking at the end of 2020. And that's okay. December 2020 is, is the that's goal. A, that's a great time for books to come out uh, because come January, diet books go crazy. Uh, this one yeah. sounds like crazy every January. So I get nice. it. But one of the things that you mentioned in there was you're trying to make it accessible to the patient um, and the client that you would see uh, because that, that was the whole reason I wrote the Clarity books and all the other books I do. My style is the same as yours. I want to make this accessible to people because people hear all these terms out there. Uh, I guess autophagy is the big one everybody talks about now. Uh, back when I was first writing about keto, it was gluconeogenesis and kind of some of these other kind of concepts, even beta hydroxybutyrate. People just go, what's that? So yeah. you got to make it accessible to them to get them interested. Then they go read all the nerdy books by Paul Saladino and some of the ones that talk a little more complex. And that guy back there, Dr. Steve Finney. Uh, in fact, you were mentioning earlier how uh, your partner was concerned when you first started eating the meat because that sounds like a fad and you're, you're not going to be good. But then quickly noticed, oh, my gosh, everything switched. He did a study in the 1980s. I'm not sure if you've looked up Steve Finney's work, but he did like the first major ketogenic research study. It was on uh, exercise, basically, these, these endurance athletes that there were very high carb eaters. And what they did, that what they wanted to test was the veracity of going on a very low carb ketogenic diet to see what would happen to performance. Well, it was only supposed to be a two week study. So two weeks in, they're suffering because they oh, yeah. had fully made the adaptation yet. Steve and his wisdom in the 80s, uh, some reason he said, okay, I want to go one more week. And in the one more week, they not only got back to baseline with their performance, they exceeded baseline of performance. And they were fully fat adapted, eating a very low carb, very high fat diet. Um, and it's those kinds of things that, you know, we have heroes, literally still living heroes amongst us that have been pushing this. And we're all standing on each other's shoulders trying to get the, the word out. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. We're such, in society now, we're such a, such a quick fix society. You know, I've had people tell me like, oh, I tried the ketogenic diet and it didn't work. And I'll say, well, how long did you do it? Oh, for a couple of days, you know, a week. Yeah. And even like in, you know, I'm, I'm so fortunate, Zach Vitters, um, you know, the current 100 mile world record holder is my coach. And when I was transitioning to a um, very low carb diet, you know, he said, we're going to take a whole month and we're going to run very easy. You know, a lot of people make a mistake. Like if you're if you're in high intensity training and you're a high carbohydrate athlete, that's a big mistake. Like you can't just if you go cold turkey, it won't work. You're, you're going to perform terrible. You're going to feel terrible. You have to give your body time to transition. And I believe like. I'll even be more fat adapted as time goes on. You know, this November, it'll be a year, even in next year, you know, it take it takes time. You know, we have to, and that's why I love running. It's like one of the few, I don't know, kind of metaphors in life for, for, you know, buying into the process. You know, I run every day. You just kind of like, and I mean, as you know, that's the secret to success. It's not six minute abs. It's not a diet pill. It's not a weight loss shake. It's time on task. You know, it's committing to the process. It's finding what you're passionate about. And putting in the work every single day, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean that's fantastic. And a lot of a lot of people, and I know a lot of runners. Like as we've gotten a little bit older, you know, I'm not 20 anymore. People will say like, "Oh, my body, like I just can't do it anymore." And I thought that too. Like I thought I'm just too old. But when I transitioned to a low carbohydrate diet, I was floored. Like my recovery and my, you know, my wife would tell you like it's night and day. Like I can literally go for a 20 mile run and come home and do yard work. Maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I should pretend I don't feel as good. I don't know. Get me out of yard work. I haven't thought of that. But no, I feel like so much. I feel so much better. I sleep better. Right. I'm putting everything is better. Like when I was on that high carbohydrate diet, I don't think I realized how much inflammation it was right. causing, you know, and uh, and it's just you. It's so hard. You know, as a, as a woman, we're always taught like we need to eat these really small portions. We have to calorie restrict. And that doesn't work. It just feels really good. And I'm sure, you know, I've talked to many men. I've been fortunate that have struggled with eating disorders and other things. Your body is meant to have a lot of protein. You're not meant to be hungry. You're not meant to be staring at the clock. You know, when, when I eat, you know, I don't eat small amounts of food. I eat very large amounts, high meat, high fat. I do supplement with small amounts of carbohydrates for my running. But, you know, it's, it's most days it's under 25 grams. Long run days, it's about 50 grams. 
you know, used to be 400, <laughs> 500 grams. So when you do that, you know, you, everything changes, you know, and, and now what's happening in our hospitals and what's happening with our population is we're replacing those high protein, high saturated fat foods. You said like meat is a condiment. Well, if meat's a condiment, you got to eat something else. So what are you eating? You know? In their world, you're eating legumes and grains and vegetables and fruit and oh. other plants. I got a story about that. So in 2011, I was so severely anemic. Like I was, and I was even eating meat. I was eating at least three ounces of meat a day. You know, obviously that's not a ton, we know. But I, I was supplementing, I was taking iron pills, like two or three pills a day. But I was eating so much legumes, so much, um, you know, bread. Those things, I mean, we aren't taught in dietetics about anti-nutrients, you know, it's almost considered like, ooh, this is this weird concept that doesn't exist. No, it's real. We're going to talk about when you are taking in, you know, beans and nuts and all this other stuff, it binds to iron. I was so anemic that I literally fell asleep on my desk, on the S key, actually. I typed a 12-page email of just S, and I ended up um, having to get five iron IVs. And I mean, that helped. I got my ferritin went up, but then guess what? You know, it wasn't until I really removed all of those foods that bind with iron. You know, anemia is the number one cause or one of the um, number one deficiencies in the entire world. 25%, 25% and it's higher for toddlers is anemic. That's bananas. You know, we, we, we need to eat more meat and eat less stuff that's binding to meat. Well, and that's the unfortunate thing. They have vilified red meat to the point that the number one source of protein in America is chicken. And when I was interviewing Ben Bigman recently, he was saying, ancestrally, we weren't meant to eat chicken. We were meant to eat pork and beef and, and wild animals. And it, it's it, we've gotten so far away from the natural human diet, as Dr. Barry always talks about, that we don't even recognize what we're doing is even off the wall which is why the focus on red meat specifically, we've got to get back to that being the basis of your meal. And then we can talk about things around it, but that should be the basis, not a chicken breast, not grains, not anything else. And a lot of it is being reinforced by all these negative images about saturated fat and red meat, pushed primarily by the 3% of the population that happens to think a plant-based diet is good. Ugh. I, I I mean, I agree with you a thousand percent. There's a big movement, you know, living right outside of Portland, Oregon. There's a lot of vegans and veganism. And, you know, unfortunately, that's another thing we don't do a good job of teaching in dietetics. Um, you know, just because an item, let's say this soy tofu thing has 11 grams of protein, this steak is exactly, I don't know, an ounce, an ounce and a half has 11 grams of protein. They are not equal. They are not equal. We don't, the label does not say what your body can actually absorb. Your body cannot absorb all this. Soy, we know soy has um, trypsin inhibitors, meaning it actually doesn't allow your body to utilize the protein in it. At the same time, it's got, you know, estrogen, it's got isoflavins. And at the same time, it's going to bind, it's got phytate. So it's going to bind to iron, <laughs> you know, same thing with like, like vegetables, like a vitamin A in a carrot is not the same as a vitamin A in liver. Like, I think that's where a lot of the confusion has come from. Cause people will be like, Oh, look at my vegan protein. It's got this much protein. It's like your body can't absorb that. This is why I'm not a fan of like protein powders, because when you get a protein powder, let's just say whey, mm -hmm. um, some people do okay with protein, others don't. But it's like you assume that's exactly the same as eating a ribeye steak. It is not. Like you get all the complete proteins in something like red meat. Whereas when you eat tofu, that example of tofu protein, whole nother story when it comes to complete proteins. It's not even close. Yeah, you know, I like I like using the analogy of, um, you know, the human body is like a supercomputer. You know, like you have to put in the correct input. And red meat is the exact correct input. because, And we've also done just such a terrible job of saying like, oh, humans just need protein. No, you don't. You need protein. You need the B vitamins. You need the zinc, the folate, the carnosine, the carnitine, the taurine. Those are all in this package of red meat. This is what, the, you know, you put it in the supercomputer, it functions great. You know, you put the tofu in, all of a sudden you've got like error, error. You know, it's like when you're trying to log in and you just have to change your password. And so you keep putting the wrong one in. It's... The further we've gotten away, um, you know, from a species-specific diet, 
And you know, it's curious to me, we don't do this with any other species. Like I, um, in my home, we've got a, a 15 year old chow shepherd. She's actually lying on the floor over here. We've got a baby tortoise and we have five chickens. I, this morning before I came on with you, like I have to chop up very specific food. Like it gets radicchio, it gets lettuce. If I feed this tortoise chocolate, it'll die, you know? And that's not like up for debate. You know, we feed the species, the species specific diet. And so for humans, we have a species specific diet, red meat, saturated fat works very well. And it's just like, I don't know, it's people, people want to debate it. People want to say, well, this is better when we've shown that when you move away from that species specific diet, you have all kinds of health consequences. Well, and there's the problem too. It was Ansel Keys who back in the fifties did these force feeding of rabbits Talk about species specific diet. They force fed rabbits who were not intended to eat saturated fat. They force saturated fat in their mouth. Well, of course they got heart disease. It was not the species correct diet. So I love the point you're making here. And now we're getting all of human, uh, basically dietary recommendations based on models that looked at what happened to a rabbit. And it's like, yeah. people don't know that history. They just know, oh, saturated fat, bad. It's always been bad. It was bad <sighs> until they force fed rabbits and said it raised their cholesterol and thus raised their heart disease. That's going to happen in humans. And then they went and kind of made the seven country study, which was totally bogus. Yeah. It was 26 countries, not seven. Yeah, I have very strong feelings on that. I get very. Yeah, <laughs> go. Yeah, you know, I mean, I reference that in my book, like his study would be thrown in the trash. You don't get to take what, you know, it, it was like 32 percent of a doctor you know, operated on a hundred people and 68% died, you wouldn't be like, look at this 32% that lived, you know, like his, his study is totally biased and it is massively affected our nutrition guidelines. You know, I have a whole chapter in my book about where did these guidelines come from? And it's bizarre. It was kind of, it's like kind of the perfect storm of, you know, you have Ansel Keys, you had, um, you know, you had the Vietnam war going on. So you needed, you know, Nixon needed more um, support. And so he, you know, wanted to get the farmers on board and you had high I mean, there's a lot of stuff that kind of like, it's this crazy story. And then you get, you know, the very beginning, you have um, Ellen White and the Seventh Day Adventist Church, and uh, it's wild. And but don't yeah, I, 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 I like to talk, heart disease is really, it's hard to understand because like you said, most people just say saturated fat, bad, saturated fat clogs your arteries. And if you look at an artery, if you ever have the opportunity to see a clogged artery, I mean, it really does, like you can find LDL in there. And I think that's where the confusion came from. People are like, oh my God, LDL is in this clog. LDL is bad. But then you, I always tell people like, you have to ask why. You have yeah. to look at the context, you know? Like I use the example in my book. If I'm driving my car to work every day, drive my car to work, go to work, come home, drive my car to work, everything's working fine. One day I drive my car to work and all of a sudden I'm stuck. And I'm like, what's going on? And I get out of my car and I notice there's tar on the road. And I'm like, oh man. And then I look up and the car in front of me is stuck with tar. I wouldn't say my car is the problem. I would say the tar on the road is the problem. And that's exactly what happens in your, your arteries. You know, we have evidence that the arteries actually become sticky. And what makes arteries sticky? Insulin resistance. The LDL gets caught in there from insulin resistance. We, I mean, I'm citing over 10 studies about that. So it's not, so it looks like the, you know, the car, the car has been doing, you know, getting me to work and back. The LDL has been doing its functions, but when you have insulin resistance and inflammation, it gets stuck. So. Well, and that's the other thing people forget about the role of cholesterol in the body is not to be this horrible thing that's supposed to give you bad health. The body makes its own cholesterol. And so it's there for a purpose. I, I wrote a whole book about that one too, nice. uh, all about cholesterol and that you heal the inflammation and the way it heals the inflammation in the body is it sends cholesterol to be that healing agent. And I often use the analogy, it's like the firefighter going to the scene of the fire, just because the firefighters at the fire doesn't mean the firefighter is the one that started it. It's exactly. The to deal with it. The fire is the problem, and we don't talk enough about the fire, and in this case, the inflammation, and the inflammation that's brought on by the carbs and the seed oils and the stress and all the other things that raise inflammation in the body. Absolutely, you know, and I do think you made a really good point. Um, you know, nutrition, I think if we can get that part right, I think we're gonna see like, we would switch the health of our nation, right? 
but I do, I do validate that there are other factors. Cause I've had people tell me like, Oh, what about sleep and a stress? Absolutely. Like those things all matter. And we even know that there's certain um, autoimmune conditions that can cause inflammation throughout the body. But I still, I just come back though. If we can switch, you know, how we're eating, I think all those other things are going to fall in line much more, much easier. By the way, the dietary guidelines, I'm not sure if you put it in your book or not, and you still have time to add it, I suppose. But look up where Harvard researchers were paid off in the late 60s by the Sugar Association. They were about to come out with a major study uh, that would have been really bad for sugar. Uh, mm -hmm. And they were paid the equivalent of today's money, 50 grand. This was yep. a big story like four years ago. Oh, you did put it in there. That's okay. in there. <laughs> Then here, here's the connection to the dietary guidelines. Then the, that guy at Harvard ended up being one of the consultants in 1976 on the precursor to what would become the very first dietary guidelines for Americans. Oh, in that I he was on that board that ended up making the dietary guidelines. So he's the one that was pushing this low fat agenda because he got paid. And yeah. people realize Money is power talked, and it's now got us living here 40 years later, still stuck on stupid. <laughs> that I didn't know. I didn't know about the study. I didn't know that that, that got one of the guys was on the board. So I'll make sure I include that. And I mean, I could see why he's like, oh, crap. I, I you know, I, I pushed this agenda. I better keep pushing it just in case. Yeah, it actually is so, it's super interesting to me that we know that, right? So we're like every, that came out like saying, hey, guys, saturated fat is not bad. It's sugar. And then we have all these studies that say, like, look, there's no evidence to demonize saturated fat. But because there's so much money, the guidelines aren't shifting. Yeah. And, and John Yudkin was pretty much blacklisted in the early 70s for speaking out um, sweet, white and deadly or whatever it was called. The, the name yeah. of his book, John Yudkin, huge hero posthumously. Like here we are 40 years later. And we're talking about the very concepts that he was talking about in the early 70s. We could have avoided all the low fat nonsense that we dealt with in the 80s. Um, had and, and you were a child of the 80s. Uh, I was an older child. I'm 48, so a little older than you are. Um, and remember, like them teaching us the food guide pyramid. And we had to memorize how many grains, servings of grains we were supposed to have in a day. It was horrible, the pyramid and everything. Mm -hmm. um, but it's like indoctrination if you stop and think about it. It truly is. It really is. And there's also, um, you know, I think one of the things that like those big sponsors, like people have, like what is Coca-Cola buying or what is Pepsi buying? What are General Mills buying by sponsoring the Academy of Nutrition? Because most dietitians are not going to go into a diabetic patient room and be like, hey, you need to drink a Pepsi. Um, but what they're buying is they're buying the, the ideal of moderation. You know, and moderation is no, nobody <laughs> knows. Nobody knows what that is. And even statistically, you know, your brain is if you if you think something's good, you will say, oh, I do it in moderation. And right. we know that the human the human body just does not moderate carbohydrates. It wasn't designed to do that. I mean, most people watching your show, listening to your podcast and myself included, we've all probably um, plowed through, you know, a pint of ice cream, eating cake, like it's very easy to overeat on those carbohydrates. It's your body has lots of built-in mechanisms to prevent you from overeating on like meat, like saturated fat and protein, but it, it doesn't for carbohydrates. But by telling a patient like, oh yeah, you can have sugar in moderation. We're basically keeping them stuck because we can't, you know, it, to keep, to keep money coming in for, for pro, uh, processed food companies and pharmaceuticals, you can't make someone healthy because then they're no longer a consumer and you can't kill them. So, but if we keep you right in the middle, you know, and that's why we're finding America, you know, 70% overweight, 40% obese, 88% with metabolic dysfunction. Um, yeah, that's where we find ourselves in, in this conundrum. Can I tell you what was disheartening in your industry, the dietetic industry, when COVID-19 went down and everybody was suddenly in lockdown and then everybody started getting stressed over the race relations and tension stuff. Dietitians in Canada and Australia, I saw stories all around the world of dietitians saying, we know you're having a tough time right now. Go ahead and eat that junk food. It'll be okay. You need that for your mental health. You need that to stay stable. And right now, just feeling good is what the goal should be. And I'm yes. thinking, oh, 
you are supposed to be the purveyors of all things good when it comes to nutrition, and you're telling people to eat the very thing that is the antithesis of healthy nutrition. It really bothers me, and I cannot tell you how much flack I get from other dietitians for um, for standing against that, you know? And I understand, like, in theory, the concept of, like, you should be able to eat all foods, um, I, I get it in theory, especially coming from somebody who was severely anorexic, who you have all these food fears, but we have to, as, as nutrition professionals and, and nutrition leaders, we have to say these things cause harm. These things are not, in my opinion, even food. I'm not calling it a candy bar food or a soda food. Um, and telling somebody, oh, you've had a stressful day or, oh, you feel bad, eat this food, to me is the equivalent of saying, oh, you've had a stressful day, let's mess up your brain and cause more depression, but you'll get about a minute high. You know, I don't tell a drug addict to go, you know, shoot up oh, because it'll make you feel better. You know, I and once again, I get a lot of flack for this, um, but I just I, I think it's the wrong message. I think moderation is the wrong message. I think, you know, eating sugar, I think it's harmed so many people and it's confused so many people. You have the nutrition experts saying, go have a scoop of ice cream. Like, it, 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 and people are different. Maybe, maybe you or I, and I don't, I don't know as much about your backstory. Maybe I can have ice cream and I'm not going to be set up for a binge. But a lot of people are. And a lot of people, if you're already overweight or diabetic, that's the worst thing you can possibly do. And we need nutrition professionals to say, look, guys, this is a super stressful time. This is the time to double down on good behaviors. This is the time to, to analyze your, your coping mechanisms. This is the time to start cutting out inflammatory foods, such as carbohydrates upping the protein and fat and because that's going to actually support your healing eating more sugar is just going to make things worse well and here's the ironic thing it's in the midst of a global health pandemic about a virus and if covid19 prevention is the goal and it should be right now we're all going to get it eventually so when you get it you want your body to be in the best tip-top shape it could possibly be and last time i checked twinkies ding dongs doritos and coca-cola ain't going to get you there yeah, it's really funny. Like, you know, I obviously work in a hospital and we have we've had COVID-19 patients and we've had patients die. It's it's it is it is a global pandemic and it is real and it is it is, you know, it's sad. It, it's affected every human I know, whether it's someone, you know, has gotten sick or you've gotten sick or financially in some way. Um, and I wish the message was we have to we have to be healthier humans and this is the way to do it. You know, we're, we've seen studies and I reference this too as well in my book that if you have the patients with higher LDL are actually doing better, you know, in the absence of high blood sugar, you know, LD, high LDL is a really good thing. You know, it's, it's antiviral. It, it binds, the, it can bind to the virus and actually keep your body healthy. Um, and so if everybody, if the entire U.S. followed a low carbohydrate, high meat, high fat diet, I don't think, well, yeah, I guess I just say what I think. I don't think we'd be in this situation. I don't think stuff would have had to close down. And I mean, but that's just kind of how, how healthcare in our country is. I mean, where everyone's waiting for a, a vaccine, you know, we can open up when we have a vaccine, um, where if we, would, if we could switch how we eat and how we live, it, it would be unnecessary. Yeah, I've never seen anything like this in all of my life, um, where we're like basically shutting down because of a virus. Um, and it's not to say that there aren't susceptible people out there. If you're in that most susceptible category, you take care of yourself. But for someone who's generally healthy um, and is doing all the measures that they need to do, it seems prudent to not shut down everything. Um, and that's kind of been kind of the debate, the debate out there over this. But nothing from on high about how to boost your own immunity, how to improve your metabolic health. Whereas in the UK, we're seeing Boris Johnson, the guy that leads the country, come out and say, hey, country, we need to fix our diet right now uh, because when the next pandemic comes, and it might, we've got to be ready. Yeah, yeah. And I would imagine there's just a lot of, you know, just like the, the nutrition guidelines not being adjusted. There's no reason that they shouldn't be adjusted with the current information we have. But when you have so much money and so much power here, because if you what if you say like, hey, look, we, we can't have sugar and we can't have carbs. I mean, Coca-Cola is like, uh, uh we're not putting out that message. Right. So it's unfortunate. You know, we really are going to have to continue to take a grassroots movement, continue to advocate kind of on a, on a lower level versus like a, a government level, at least in my opinion. 
Well, I am super happy that you are in this community now. I've been here for 15 years. I love see seeing new people come into the fold. Uh, you're you. not new to the industry, but you're new to the community that we're in. And we're very happy to have you as part of the greater keto carnivore community. And you're doing great work. I hope you keep it going. Run, eat, meet, repeat is who she <laughs> Thank you. Instagram. Go check her out, you guys. She is Michelle Hearn and Michelle. Thanks so much for being here today. Oh, this was fantastic. Thank you so much for having me.